Joshua 1, 1 through 9. After the death, death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instruction must not depart from your mouth, you are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it, for then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You may be seated. If your first time uh, here with us, I'd like to encourage you, if, if, if you'd like, there's an optional time for um, kids, kindergarten through second grade, to go and study the Word with some volunteers. And uh, so if you're, it's your first time here and your kids have never been there, I would encourage you as parents to take them down there to make sure we have them uh, pr- properly checked in. If you would open your Bibles to Joshua, or turn your Bibles on and find Joshua, and we're going to start a new series today on this book. And I love this book for so many reasons. It's just an epic um, of God's wonderful acts in history, uh, a reminder of his faithfulness in, in the face of circumstances which just seem unlikely, if not impossible. And today we're going to look at courageous faithfulness, which is what we've titled the entire series, but we're going to primarily focus on Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And if you know your Bible history, you know that Joshua picks up um, in this epic saga where Deuteronomy left off. Moses had led Israel out of this exhausting slavery in Egypt in Exodus. And God used Moses to constitute Israel as God's people with the covenant and the law at Mount Sinai. And at this point, Moses and Israel had tirelessly wandered through the the desert for for years as they approached Canaan, the promised land. And now you have Israel encamped on the eastern side of the Dead Sea in the plains of Moab, just at the point where they are about to enter the promised land of Canaan. And Moses is gone, he's dead. And Joshua has been named as the leader of the people. So this, this right here, where we pick up, where we begin this narrative is an exceptional moment in the life of Israel. And one of the reasons is they stand on the brink of doing what the previous generation failed to do because they lacked courage, because of their fear. In Numbers 13 and 14, we read that the previous generation went to spy on Canaan. And you read in chapter 13, and and the people come back to Moses and they say this, We came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and its fruit is amazing. However, however, Moses... The people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. So what you read is the first generation of the Israelites grumbled against God and Moses and said, Look, why is the Lord, why would God bring us all the way to here, out of Egypt and through the desert, to this point where we're going to fall by the sword? I mean, the people in Canaan outnumbered Israel. 
And Israel had little experience in battle and no experience in sieging fortified cities. And so in Numbers, Israel concludes, look, we, we can't do this. We're not able to go up against the people. That's their words. They are stronger than we are. And if you know your history, the Bible, because of their refusal to believe God and do what he says, God's judgment came upon them and only Joshua and Caleb and the children survived and were able to enter into the land. So here you are. The second generation stands in the same place with the same fears. And the question is, will they trust God and will they be obedient to his word? This is a momentous occasion. Entrance into the land. Entrances are important. I mean, the first time you do something, it's an important milestone in your life or in the life of, the, of a nation. And this is why one-fourth of the entire book of Joshua is devoted to, just to entering the land. And so in the face of all these fears, let me give you kind of the main point of the sermon. Then we're going to unfold it through the first nine verses. God's promises... And presence are the anchors, are the anchor of our courage. If you can take God's promises and his presence, that becomes the anchor of your courage in the face of fear and doubt. So let's start in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and look at the courage they gain from God's promise. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant... The Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, who was Moses' assistant, the second in command. Moses was grooming him to, to, to be in this place. Look at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot Treads, just as I promised Moses, your territory will be all the land. So Joshua begins with this momentous change in the life of Israel. Now, many changes are exciting in our lives, aren't they? Baby's first steps, first words, first day of school, you know, the first time you fall in love, your first romance. And then you have other changes, other changes which aren't so welcome. Your first broken heart, your loss of a job, the loss of a loved one. And this book begins with a change that's not so welcome. I mean, some of the first words here is, Moses is dead. And so you open the book and you attend a funeral. And there's no one like Moses at all. In the Old Testament, there's no one as great as Moses, and now he's dead, but his memory is still very alive. In fact, he's mentioned almost 60 times in the book and 11 times in chapter 1. This helps you understand the impact of his leadership in the history, but also the crisis of this very moment. Even when God buries the workmen, the work must go on. When I was in seminary, I served as an intern at a church in Winston-Salem. I eventually became one of the pastors there. But at the time of my arrival, uh, the new pastor had only been there and had been the senior pastor for only a few years. And it became quickly apparent to me. I mean, I didn't grow up in the church. I was somewhat unfamiliar with the church. But as I, I became an intern and started to serve there, it became quickly apparent to me that the previous pastor was well-loved and missed. I mean, he had been there for 43 years. He had served that church faithfully for 43 years until his retirement. And that long-tenured pastor had a very special place in the hearts of those people and still does. He's still mentioned in many conversations within that church. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's good for the, the pastor to be loved, but the problem is for some of the people in that church, the church's identity and her mission were so entangled with his leadership that when he left, there was a sense of loss. There was a sense of confusion. 
not only for the man, but also for what the church used to be. It is almost like the people were saying, what are we going to do now? We followed this man for 43 years and now he's gone. We've all seen it before. When a leader moves on or dies, some people lose their grip on reality, don't they? In some cases, the organizations or churches will almost destroy themselves in order to embalm the past. And the reality is, when it comes to God's people and, and the church, I mean, you can start with the church, every, every pastor is an interim pastor. They are. We are. And every leader is a temporary leader. That's not to say that leaders are unimportant. It's to say that leaders are not ultimate. God's work will go on. And when you enter the narrative of Joshua, you have to be able to focus on the fact that one of the first things it said is Moses is dead. Now the word, look at the word here. It doesn't say Moses has died. Now you must turn back. It doesn't say Moses has died. Now you must weep and wait. It says Moses is dead. Now continue on. Verses 2 and 3. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. So Moses may be dead, but the promise, God says, still stands. Now this is a great reminder for Joshua as he takes the reins of leadership. It, it's been God's work up until this point. It will be God's work that continues to, to provide and protect and, and allow his promises to come to pass. So Joshua, yes, he, he'll be the one that leads Israel into the land, but it's God who gives them the land. Now, I love the, the wording of verse 3. Look in your, your scripture. I am giving you, well, in fact, I have, that's past tense, I have given you every place that your foot will tread. In Hebrews, uh, every, every place is given the emphasis in the sentence. In other words, if Joshua walks there, it belongs to Israel. This is a call for step-by-step -step obedience to the promise that has already been made. Talk about walking in the promises, walking by faith. So the blessing of the past promises is obtained by present obedience for Joshua. And God's promises don't evaporate in the face of funerals or in the face of obstacles like rivers, do they? They stand. And not only is Israel armed with courage from God's promise, the second part of this is they have courage from God's presence. Verses 5 and 6. No one, doesn't matter how big they are, how strong they are, how fortified their cities are, what kind of weapons they have, no one, Joshua, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you, says God, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. So, therefore, look at verse 6, be strong and courageous. For you will distribute the land that I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. Moses is dead, but I, the Lord God, lives. In verse 5, he makes three promises. God says, you don't need to fear that any enemy will stand against you because they will not stand. Number two, he says, I am with you just as I was with Moses. And number three, he says, I will not abandon you. Now notice here, it doesn't say, Joshua, I want you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and grit your teeth and willpower the courage by your own might to do this on your own. No, the, the, the promise is, that God's presence is his strength. I will be with you. So Joshua doesn't have to be strong because God is his strength. And the presence of God, his strength, is the basis of his courage. Now, as a father of three children, I know this truth well in experience. There are times when our children will wake up in the middle of the night scared. They're unsure. 
You know, you, know how, you know how it is in the dark, in the middle of the night. There are noises. There are irra- irrational fears and thoughts of, of monsters in closets or under beds or shadows lurking. In most cases, their fears are irrational and, and they exist only in their minds. And, and there are times when, say, you know, Ruby, I'll give, use Ruby as the example. She's five. When, when she comes and wakes us up because she's scared. In those moments, all she wants is the presence of her father or her mother. Now, most of the time, they, she'll crawl on the bed and we just leave her because I'm too tired to get up and put her back in her bed. But there are times when I'm thinking, no, I want the full room to stretch out and I will carry her back to her bed and I will lay there with her in her bed for a few minutes until she's either able to fall asleep or comfortable enough to fall asleep. Now, let me ask you, as I take her back into her room and put her back in her bed, has anything changed in the room? No, it's still dark. There's still weird noises. What changes is my presence. I'm in the room with her. And it's my presence that causes her to be comfortable even in the midst of her fears, to face her fears. So my presence becomes her source of courage. Beloved church family, sometimes God's people need to the point reassurance in moments of fear and doubt, don't we? It's amazing how many times in redemptive history, in Scripture, God reassures his people with the promise of his presence. Think about Jacob when he's on the run for his life in Genesis 28. God speaks to him at Bethel and says, I am with you, I will not leave you or forsake you. Moses reiterates these same words in Deuteronomy 30, 31, talking to Joshua. The Lord will be with you. He will not leave or forsake you. David charges Solomon at the building of the temple in 1 Chronicles 28. Listen, be strong and courageous, Solomon. God will not forsake you. And then you read the promise of Isaiah to the people who are in exile. Fear not, I am with you. How fitting is it then that when you open up the gospel accounts in Matthew chapter 1, you see the words of the angel declaring to Mary, you will give birth to a son and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. As John 1.14 tells us with Jesus' arrival, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God will not turn away from us. In fact, he dwells among us. Even on the cross, Jesus took the wrath of God because of our sin and the Father turned away. And in that moment, we realize that Jesus was forsaken by God so that you and I would never have to be. His death means that death will never separate us from the presence of the Father. His resurrection assures us that to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. And even when Jesus' work was finished, before he ascended, he looks at the, the apostles before he sends them out to the worldwide mission field and gives them the promise, I am with you always even to the end of the age. I will never leave you, never forsake you. So therefore, you can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What in the world can man do to me? That's the promise of God. So I look at this and I wonder, what are you facing this morning? What obstacles, what difficulties? Now understand, this is a principle we're lifting out of the the passage And this is a specific promise to Joshua as the captain of the people of God as they're about to enter the land and conquer it. But as we have seen, this is a promise that is reiterated throughout the scriptures in different contexts. And so I would say that, yes, the promise of God's presence rests on all of us in Jesus Christ. So perhaps you're here this morning and and you're a child of God and you're, you're trusting in Jesus But your life is an absolute mess. Jesus says to you, I will never leave you or forsake you. And perhaps you're here this morning and you're going through maybe the ravages of relational disasters. And you feel like everything in your life or your marriage or your children or your friends, it's all falling apart. Jesus says, look, child of God, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
some calamity or disease may be, have befallen you. And just hear this. Right now, Jesus' voice, may it echo, reverberate through your soul, his sovereign voice that says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The same promise that God made to Moses and Joshua is the same promise we received from Jesus Christ himself. God's presence is your courage. You don't have to be strong because God is your strength. So take courage from his presence. But lastly, number three, there is courage for God's precepts. Verses 7 through 9. Above all, there's a lot of important things, a lot of great majestic truths already been said. And then he says in verse 7, above all, focus here. Be strong and very courageous to do what? Be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. Verse 8, this book of instruction must not Listen, Joshua, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Once more, he says it again. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Don't you love how God repeats the same command three times in four verses? Be strong and courageous. And when somebody repeats something, that means you need to listen, right? I want you to notice something significant here. The first command there is be strong and courageous. To do what? To observe carefully the whole instruction. Be strong and courageous to observe the law. Now, what does obedience to the law have to do with entering and finding rest in the land? You may have thought, well, why didn't why the verse say, be strong and courageous to take the land? No, it says, be strong and courageous first and foremost to observe the law. It has everything to do with taking the land because the land did not belong to Cain and it did not belong to Israel, it belonged to God. Therefore, if Israel hoped to flourish in the land, they would need to order their lives around God's instruction. This is why verse 8 tells Joshua to meditate on the word of God. The word translated meditate means to mutter, to read aloud, to discuss with others, to store up the word within you in so much that when you face your fears and troubles, the word will come pouring out of you. Now, some of you ladies, and perhaps some of you men in the room, have um, jewelry on right now with, with, with precious stones. Some of you uh, women have a rock on your finger that was given to you by someone you love. Let me ask you, have you, ever, have you ever held that ring up into the light and turned it and allowed the light to shine through the different facets of that stone and to reflect in different places? It's beautiful. You see different colors, different facets of the light. This is the, the language that's being used right here to meditate on the law. Allow the, the law of God, like light reflecting through a multifaceted stone, to reflect on every area of your life. Turn the law over in your mind and speak it through your mouth so that every area of your life would be under its brightness. So the command is, fully integrate your life, Joshua, so that in the hour of need, the light of the word shines through the darkness. Therefore, I think what we can say to us, if you hope to flourish in this life, you need to order your life around God's word, his instruction. Now, don't take this 
as health and wealth and prosperity gospel. I'm not saying your life's going to be easy or that you're going to be prosperous materially if you, if you heed this word. It's not what it's saying. That's not what Joshua was saying. However, I will say this. You will be prosperous and successful in the sense that when you take the word of God like this and allow it to shine on every area of your life, you will be able to wisely face life's challenges. So even when the circumstances of life take you by surprise or you don't know what the future holds, remember, at this point, Israel's primary concern is obedience to God's laws or precepts. So he's saying, Israel, even though you don't know what's going to come, I'm just telling you, be focused on being obedient. That will give you wisdom to face these challenges. Have you ever thought about the fact that God did not give Israel explanations at this point in chapter 1? He didn't give them explanations on how they would accomplish what he was calling them to do. He doesn't lay out an eight-step plan to conquer the land at this point. All he says is, be obedient to my word. God's people live on his promises and by his precepts, not by explanations. We live by faith. And we apply the word in faith in circumstances, even when we face fear. It's faith enough to be careful to do everything God asks you to do, regardless of the circumstances. So the words do not fear is a test. Will Joshua and Israel trust God? Let me point out one more thing in the text before we conclude. The exact wording of chapter 1, verse 9 is very significant. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. So as they enter Canaan, they will be warring with a people who worship a false god, in fact, a false god that doesn't exist. And their false gods were very moody, very unpredictable. And God says, look, the Lord, your God, is with you. That's how the translation here renders it, but it's the Hebrew word for Yahweh. In other words, God's using his personal name here, and he's saying, look, be obedient to my precepts, trust in my promises, and know that you have my personal presence intimately. You know my name. Our God is the one true God who is trustworthy. You know, in a book like Joshua, we need to be careful as we, as we, as we read it and try to apply it to our lives because as New Testament Christians, we don't directly appropriate the promises to Joshua and to Israel. We're not Israel. We're not Joshua. But I will say this, that there's a larger theme I want to close with here that I think will encourage you. As 1 Peter 1.4 reminds us, we are being kept for an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. In fact, if you read the book of Hebrews, one of the things the author of Hebrews does is shows us that we, the people of God, are like Israel, journeying through this land, heading to the promised land, which is the new heavens and new earth with Christ Jesus. Just as Joshua led Israel to conquer corrupt Canaan, which was a place cursed by sin, Christ will come and conquer this corrupt world, a place cursed by sin, and will establish his eternal throne here on the earth. Christ will return and he will physically defeat all of his enemies once and for all. And unlike the wars of the Old Testament, which led, led to more bloodshed and misery, Christ's global judgment and victory when he comes here will be the war that ends all wars. And on that day, if you have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you will enter into the promised land. And this is not no longer restricted to a strip of land in the Middle East, but now as Romans 4 tells us, this is now expanded to the entirety of the earth. 
One day, Christ himself will wipe away every tear in your eye and every fear from your heart, and you will enter into his presence forevermore. And as Revelation 21 reminds us, the dwelling place of God will be with man. Church family, one greater than Joshua has appeared and one day he will return again. He has truly never left us or forsaken us. God's promise and his presence is the anchor of our courage. Courage literally means to put heart into it. Nothing substantial in life happens without courage, does it? Your courage will rise when your confidence in God and his word grows. And so God's promises here are not these pillows on which we rest, but they're prods that enact obedience to his precepts. And so courage is not the lack of fear, it's the willingness to act in obedience in spite of fear. Take heart, have courage courage because Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith and he is the one who will carry it out and finish this story. Let me tell you, Jesus has already secured the victory. So in light of the future, I pray that you and I will find courage to be obedient to his word in the present. Let's pray. Father, in many areas of our lives, we, like Israel, act in unbelief. And Father, we recognize that really the essence of sin, rebelling against you, is a lack of trust or belief in your word. When we choose a sinful action over obedience, we are saying that we don't trust your word that is better than life, and we would rather pursue the things of death. And so, Father, I pray that right now you would forgive us. Those in this room who don't have the courage to fight sin, I pray that you would give them the courage by the power of your spirit as they remember the promises of your word. That they would be able to act in obedience. Father, for those of us in this room who are weary from the journey of life and we wonder when rest will ever come, I pray that you would give us comfort. For those of us who are maybe standing on the brink of decisions that We recognize what the obedient thing is to do and how it will honor you, but we also see the lurking shadow of fear and the what-ifs. I pray that you would give us the courage to do what you have called us to do. Father, above all, I pray that as we sing this last song together and as we head out into the mission field of our community, that your promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. You will always be with us, will wash over us, give us confidence and comfort and courage to live in obedience to your word. It's in Christ's name I pray. And all God's people said,